I'm here to deliver team an influence example with actual numbers, a numerical answer, and how you obtain those answers like you would in the real world. If you wanna get in on this gang, on this engineering crew, uh, do a favor if you haven't yet and subscribe down below. If not, hey, no worries, maybe next time if I catch you back in the auditorium. All right, let's get into it. I've brought over the rules that we talked about in my previous video. If you are not up to date with those, go back, pause this video, and check out that previous video to get you through those little example problems that we did. But now we're here with another example problem, a numerical one though. We're applying loads like we would in real life and we're going to get numerical values for answers. We have our loading right here. So we have a point load of 10 kips anywhere along this two span member. Anywhere along that thing, you got 10 kips that could theoretically be placed that we need to design for. Additionally, we have a distributed load of one kip per linear foot, KLF, anywhere along this line. So again, you could have, ooh, distributed load along this portion, as well as over here. You could have just over here. You could have, if my eraser works, you could have uh, just along here. You could have this little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. You get the point. You could have any of those combinations of distributed loading along your system. Well, where are the worst case scenarios when where that's applied that creates our worst shear moment and reactions? Boom. Pretty helpful when you think about it like that. You don't want to run case after case after case with all these different loading patterns to just kind of spitball and say, well, is this reaction worse? Is this shear worse? you'll spend all day spinning your wheels. Like I said, we have our two span member, points A, B, C are our boundary conditions. They're all pin conditions. Uh, okay, so yeah, you're gonna probably harp on me for thermal, you know, thermal shrinkage and all that kind of stuff, but let's bypass that for today. If you're like, what the heck are you talking about? It goes right over your head. Don't worry about it. We have, I know last time in my video, I made this little dot just as a reference to a point of interest that we were looking at for our influence lines. Today, this is actually a full-blown hinge. So moment cannot transfer through this hinge. It's like a, a ball socket, if you think about that, with two you know, um, members coming into it. And that thing, if you did this, just freely rotates. If you had, uh, oh, I know, hang on. Wow, we talk about a shameless plug for MOLA, but not sponsored in any way. They were kind enough to send me a kit, but visualize this, this is, if I'm looking at the camera, there we go, is a uh, hinge in your system, which means that you just think about this ball socket, and if you were to push a reaction down, you're not getting any moment transfer through that hinge. This thing can just freely, oh my God. This thing can just freely rotate um, and remain, you know, this member is remaining linear along its line. You're not getting any type of curvature and bending because it doesn't have the ability, again, to translate moment through this joint. So this you visualize as a hinge. If you get rid of that hinge in the middle, like we have between boundary conditions B and C, it looks like this. And this, boom, if we flex it, uh, is a continuous member, and it does have the ability to translate moment all the way through its length. So you're getting this curvature. Difference between this, boom, boom, boom. And again, if I push down on this, like I did in the other example, see how you get that curvature versus you're getting that. Good? That'll come in handy in a second here as we roll through and we determine what our influence line is. So let's get into that. Our question today is what is the max shear right of point B? Well, since we're determining what our max shear is, we need to draw our uh, influence line for shear. We're gonna draw it in blue. So remember, we want to cut, uh, like the rules say up above here, the, uh, the point of interest that we're interested in, which would be just to the right of point B. So it's like microscopically, it's like right there. And uh, this is the rule we're gonna be using today. Impose a unit shear deformation of one unit down and up um, at point where shear is to be calculated. We're cutting that open with our bread butter knife. We talked about it before. If you know, you know. And we're going to get an influence line that looks something like this. So there we are. This is V sub B right is what I'll call it. When working with numbers and your shear influence line, you get your maximum shear at the point of the greatest shear factor on your influence line. This would be at this location right here. And for our shear factor, this is going to be 1.0 because we cut down and cut up, 
But although I do have some distance here, some minuscule distance, I'll do a question mark. That's just for visuals that I like to do for myself. In reality, you are so microscopically close to your reaction point B that really this number 1.0 is approaching 1.0. It's like 0.99999 continued continued. Like the closer you get, the greater the maximum shear. Um, but you can't say 1.0 because then you're actually located on point B, which is your boundary condition, and that's a whole separate equation. So it is safe to assume that you use 1.0 for this condition, but I give that little gap visually so that I can draw my influence line correctly because you still wanna do that prying action down and up, and we went up all the way to 1.0, which means that the bottom technically is 0, 0.0. But again, there's still that little minute piece. And if we think about this, like the MOLA diagram, if we look from point A to point B, well, I can't hold it that great correctly, but if there's, if my thumb right now, this guy right here is your boundary condition B and you're pushing down like this, that's, See that? That's the shape that you're getting. And that's the shape that you ultimately get right here. And then the other side is very simple. Between uh, support B and C, you are just cutting and prying up on this side uh, right here, which means that, so you're lifting this up, whoop, that's all that's happening. So there's no curvature, there's no anything fancy, it's just a linear movement upward as you're lifting those two pieces. So that's kind of the trick here is that we have a hinge introduced. All right, but how do we use this to our advantage? Well, like I said, uh, shear due to the point load is greatest at the largest area factor, which for us is the 1.0 at the top. So we know that when our point load, we'll call it P is equal to 10 kips, is located right there, that's when we get our largest shear. And how do we calculate that number? Well, if I go back to red, that's simply just P times the area factor. Uh, so V max, let's, that's, let's do that, is just equal to 10 kips. When the point is located just to the right of point B, that's when you get your maximum shear due to that point load at just to the right of point B. Makes sense, right? Like wherever that point load is located, that's where your max shear is going to occur for the most part. If you were to move it over to the hinge, it gets a little trickier maybe, so we'll check that out. So that's the point load. What about the distributed load? Well, the maximum shear at the point of interest is greatest when the distributed load is applied um, and multiplied by all, summing all areas under the curve. We wanna take into account, if we scroll up here, if I go yellow highlight, all the area under here and under here. Anything north of our you know, original line, our red line, anything north of that, above that, we need to calculate that area to determine what the maximum shear due to the distributed load is. And the maximum occurs when you take the most amount of area. Additionally to that, that means that anywhere where we have a curve above the line is where you need to apply a distributed load in order to obtain a maximum shear. So distributed load all along here and really all along here. So along your entire system is the condition where you get your maximum shear just right of point B. That is not always the case, especially when you have uh, continuous members. Um, you, you will see that certain bays get loaded that, that uh, result in maximum shear and other bays do not get loaded. Um, it's not just always that you have everything continuously loaded, which gets you your maximum results. That is not always the case. So we need to find the area of this yellow. Well, let's do that. That's simply, oh, and one other thing we need to do though, is we have 1.0 for the peak over here, but we don't have this value. And we're gonna need that value in order to, um, you know, get the area of these triangles. Well, in our previous examples, all we have to do when we have this type of shape for shear is just take the ratio of where your hinge is. So this point here would but just be equal to um, the ratio B over L. And in this case, B is this dimension here, and L is our entire span from A to B. So going back to red, if B equals 12 feet and L equals uh, 60 feet, B over L equals 0 0.2. 
So that is your shear factor. Now we have our factors for both of our triangles, and now we have the ability to solve for the area of those triangles to obtain our maximum shear due to the distributed load. 0.2 times 60 divided by two is simply the area of this first rectangle or triangle, because you know that this height is 0.2, and you know that this length is equal to 60, so that would get you, if I go green here, if I go green, like I said, that would get you the area of this rectangle. And we know for triangles that if you take half of the rectangle, you will get the area of the triangle. So that's why we divided by two. Now we need the area of the triangle from supports B to C. So we do plus 1.0 for our shear factor, times again, the length of the span, this time it's from B to C, 60 feet, divided by two. We need to take all that area, so this is the area, times the one KLF, this is our W, our distributed load, equals 36 kips. So we have that and that, and again, this is equal to V max for the distributed load and 10 kips V max for the point load. Now, if I get my head out of the way, you could combine both of these to get summation, if I can draw that right, to get summation of V max to the right of point B is equal to both of those added up, which is 46 kips. So that is the max shear reaction just to the right of point B under all load criteria for the uniformly distributed lo load anywhere along the system and the 10 kip point load anywhere along the system. Any possible combination comes out to that being the maximum result at that location. Right before you leave, remember to, you know, smash that like button. Like it if you enjoyed me trying to incorporate some physical, you know, ooh, materials from the MOLA kit to help clarify some areas that might be a little confusing just through my speech. Let me know down below in the comments if you think this is a good idea, if you think it helped you visualize this example, and if you wanna join this engineering crew, make sure you subscribe down below if you haven't yet. Thanks to each and every one of you for hitting 8,000 subscribers. It's been an amazing journey so far. We're just getting started though. We're on our way all the way to the top, baby going to uncover all of the mysteries of the structural engineering world around us. So if you want to be a part of that, you know what to do. Click subscribe down below and I'll see you in the next video.